Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into Bloom Fireside. It has been quite a hiatus. I'm really sorry about that, but uh, we got 10 partners featured and then we wanted to take a little rethink and and really make sure that going forward, Bloom Fireside really gave something back to you, back to the listener or the viewer. So what's great is that we're expanding our horizons a little bit and we're moving on to featuring, well, we, we will still feature partners, of course, when possible. Uh, people building on Bloom, on the Bloom protocol, and you'll see some of that coming up soon. But also featuring projects and teams who align with Bloom's values. Open banking, inclusive finance, inclusive credit. Uh, you know, really opening up opportunities for uh, individuals all over the world to improve their lives. So uh, to that end, uh, this week we have Adan Sanchez de Pedro from a really cool project called WitNet Protocol. Uh, WitNet is trying to solve the Oracle problem. You might that define that differently than they do, but, uh, but that's what they're up to. And Adan uh, knows uh, one of Bloom's advisors, Luis Ivan Quende, uh, also of the Aragon Project, or Aragon if you prefer. And, uh, and so we, we actually do have some, some similarities in terms of where we're headed, what we're trying to do, uh, or you know the end goals. And, uh, and I think you'll really see that. Adan is super passionate. He speaks incredibly intelligently about WitNet. And I'm actually going to have to have him back on uh, in a few weeks or maybe a, you know back in or in January 2019 to talk about a different project that Stampery is working on called Stamp.io that you want to talk about synergy. Oh man, synergy coming out the wazoo uh, with Bloom. So uh, in the meantime, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening or watching. And I really hope you enjoy the next 40 minutes or so with Adan Sanchez de Pedro of WitNet Protocol. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, we have Adan Sanchez de Pedro from Stampery, uh, but sp specifically this week we are talking about WitNet, one of their projects. Adan, thank you so much for joining us on Bloom Fireside. Thank you for having me, Derek. Good. Uh, so for, for those who don't know, let's give them a brief a synopsis. What is WitNet? So WitNet is a decentralized Oracle network. Uh, what we are trying with, to solve with WitNet is the Oracle plugin. How, how can you have access to information from outside the blockchain from your smart contracts? So let's Let's say you have a smart contract, you need to verify something in the real world or just to consume some information from any data provider, any data source, any online API. You cannot do that at the moment from, a, let's say, an Ethereum smart contract without, trusting, without having to trust a, a particular uh, entity bringing that data into your smart contract or, or without you being a single point of failure for that contract. So if the point of a smart contract is, is having a program that no one can tamper with and that no one can censor, it, it's to totally pointless to have that kind of a uh, single point of failure. So what we're building is a network that allows smart contract developers to send uh, data requests to, to this network and have data retrieved, aggregated, and delivered back from the internet, from APIs, from any kind of online data source to their smart contracts without having to rely in any centralized uh, entity that could try to tamper with the, with the data. Yeah, I, I totally get that. You know, a big part of, I think what we're all doing here is, is creating trustless transactions. Uh, obviously, decentralization is a big part of, uh, of any blockchain. Well, most blockchains. Uh, some of them <laughs> arguably less so. But let's not get, get uh, sidetracked. Uh, so yeah, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I did have a, a you know, brief conversation with um, 
I think your developer relations uh, uh, lead, James, uh, about this. So that sounds really neat. Um, let's try and get a little bit of background here on, on the, the co-founders and some of the team members or you know key team members. Uh, there's yourself. Can you give us a little bit of background on what you've been up to before founding Stampery and, and WitNet? Well, uh, <laughs> if I go like from, 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 from the very beginning, I actually was not interested into computers when I was a kid, I was more into, into animals and dinosaurs and this sort of, of stuff. But then, uh, at some point I discovered that there was some very nice thing that was called Linux that you could install that in your computer and that it, it came with free software. What what's that free <laughs> software? And that free not as in free beer, but free as in freedom, so that you can modify that software, you can have uh, like the recipes of how it works and you can uh, change it and you can make it work the, the way you want and do whatever you want with it and you are free to share it with others and and I, get, I, I really got obsessed with uh, free software with the open source community and and I started to, to play with it I discovered that my thing was totally uh, programming and uh, actually um, what I started programming was uh, video games. I started oh, making nice. uh, indie games for for Nintendo DS and for the Nintendo Wii. Uh, but then I I, I, I developed some um, political uh, vi views, and yeah, so I got closer closer to to uh, hacktivist movement and started to to research and to develop in the area of uh, communication protocols, messaging protocols, and all kind of peer-to-peer -peer protocols. So I was quite, uh, quite involved in XMTP, which was a very popular uh, messaging protocol by the time before WhatsApp and, and Messenger and everything. Yeah. And yeah, and I worked in, yeah, I created uh, one of the projects that I'm more proud proud about is Lopi Instant Messenger, which was uh, the most uh, used application in Firefox OS, uh, which was a, a, a operating system for uh, for smartphones that the Mozilla Foundation created to uh, to bring smartphones to the to developing countries. Yeah. And it was quite a success. And then I created uh, something called Watools, which was uh, like a kind of premium version of uh, Locui, but for you, for companies wanting to use uh, the WhatsApp protocol uh, for uh, doing some kind of marketing and engaging with their users and mm -hmm. more or less what they are trying to do with WhatsApp business, but this happened uh, four or five years ago. So <laughs> at that time, Facebook wasn't really happy about me uh, releasing that software. And they actually sent me a cease and desist letter. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> a, quite, quite a threatening one. So, yeah. Yeah, but by, by that time I had been playing with, with some uh, Bitcoin stuff uh, because I, I had a lot of friends who uh, in this hacktivist movements who had been in in the bitcoin space from from uh, the early times and and i, I felt that um, it was about time for me to move into into this technology because it, it it really sounded really interesting to me it really rang a bell on me since the first time i heard about it and in 2015 uh, I joined Stampery uh, as a developer, and then I, uh, I became the CTO for Stampery. And in Stampery, what we made was uh, create a platform for people to uh, leverage public blockchains to create uh, proofs of existence, integrity, and ownership of any kind of data set. So this is like if you uh, when you wanted to prove the existence uh, or the integrity of any uh, paperwork in the past, you or, or even uh, uh, currently, you need a notary public. 
uh, someone to right. certify the, that document. So acknowledging that nowadays information and data uh, is moved in digital formats and that there are a lot of businesses and business processes in which the integrity of that data is paramount, like, like a lot of industries, uh, more, most importantly, in critical systems and in IoT, in a lot of different industries, uh, we, we felt that we had to create with that we could really leverage the power of public blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum for creating that immutable proofs of existence for that uh, digital data. So we developed a, a very uh, powerful platform for uh, making that process scalable because public blockchains actually do have some limitations in, in terms of throughput, but we created a system that uh, allows us to create that, those proofs uh, in a virtually unlimited way. And, and the, the cool thing is that those proofs are, are verifiable by any third party without having to, to trust the Stampery itself, because you can verify those proofs directly uh, with, the, with the Bitcoin or Ethereum blockchain. Right. So, so in, in Stanbury, my, my, my partner was, uh, my partners were uh, Daniela Levy, who is a serial entrepreneur, really, really early Bitcoin adopter. Uh, he ran a mining operation uh, in 2012 here in, in Spain, uh, the big, biggest one uh, in Spain. And also um, Luis Ivan Cuende, uh, who is um, even younger than me and <laughs> have been creating companies since he yeah. was 16. He also created um, a Linux gone. distribution and he's now the, the project leader at Aragon, yes. which was yeah. another, another project that uh, fort of Stampery just like mm. with it itself, which is what we are working on right now. Yeah, and, and for those who don't know, or you might be familiar, Luis is actually an advisor to Bloom, so we have a little bit of a, of a connection that way uh, already. <clears throat> Pardon me. And yeah, so Stamp.io does look really cool. We're going to do a whole other conversation about Stamp.io because uh, I, I think it's really neat and uh, and I think it could you know benefit uh, both ways for, from the Bloom ecosystem, but we'll talk about that another day. Um, so that's really, really neat. Clearly, you have some pedigree there. A quick, I don't want to start a flame, for, flame war, but I do want to know, what's your favorite Linux distribution? Uh, right now, Manjaro. Which it's one? A, it's a, Manjaro. It's like, okay. a, it's an Arch uh, derivative oh, okay. that it has very nice hardware support mm. and everything works uh, off the box. So it's it's really, really nice. Cool. Okay, I, 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 thought, I, I thought I, I would use Ubuntu forever. But because that was the, the first one I, I used, but but then when I discovered Manjaro, I, I, yeah, it, it, I, I really loved it. That's fine. Mandrake was my favorite for a long time, which the, oh. I think then became Mandriva, and and but I've gone back and forth between Fedora, CentOS for servers, uh, you know Ubuntu for servers as well. So I I get that. You know the preferences change. Linux Mint is great on a desktop or laptop, yeah, but you know hardware is always well often uh, an issue. <laughs> so uh, the website for, for Witnet describes uh, Witnet as, quote, smart contracts with real power. Can you describe, beyond what you've said already, can you describe a little bit of what that means and what that means to the rest of the team? Yeah, the, the point is that uh, smart contracts in their current form are nothing more than toys or they are limited only to support the ICO use case and probably not much more without having a connection with, with everything that's outside with other web 2.0, not 3.0 uh, services uh, with any kind of data sources and being able to make any effect on, on the real world. So mm -hmm. uh, what we say with uh, this claim of uh, giving smart contracts real power uh, means exactly that. We are allowing 
uh, smart contract developers to uh, make their their contracts affect the real world and also to to react to the real world okay um so what what sort of impact do you think smart contracts with real power can actually have on on an individual or business once witnet is really fully deployed or in other words you know how does witnet solving the oracle problem as you put it and, and other people use that term as well how does that open up opportunities for individuals and for businesses especially those in developing countries mm -hmm. where the the existing or or traditional uh, infrastructure doesn't even exist at all well first thing is that we think that witnet is a really a building block for all the all the decentralized infrastructure of the years to come and we think it's a very important one because it, it could happen to this space that uh, if we are not able to make smart contracts have a real impact on society on business on people in the next two or three years this smart contract could really it, it could really happen that they are not a thing ever. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. there are other technologies that capture the attention of the developers, of the media, of the businesses and, and so on. So we feel that kind of pressure that we have to come with, uh, with the right solution to, to this Oracle problem and, and, we, and come with that in a timely manner. So, so we are really, that, that's why we are, why we are really excited of, of being in this uh, particular place in time uh, solving this problem because it's, it's the logic evolution for us, for our mission, uh, which always was uh, to replace trust with uh, mathematical proof of with verifiable uh, truths. And that's why we built a Stampery uh, in the first place. And that's why we uh, decided to go one step beyond and take this bold uh, decision of creating something like uh, WetNet, because we really believe it can have a big, a very big impact on, on, on these um, technologies that will empower people and that will uh, enable a, people to transact and businesses to to make trade without uh, any kind of censorship or without uh, tampering and yeah we're 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 really excited to be a part of that um i'm guessing as well you going back earlier about mentioning you know notary publics being the that person you know or that organization who often you know literally physically stamps a piece of paper uh, to say, yes, this is real. I witnessed uh, a Don and Derek signing this contract or something like, or, you know, agreeing to this or what have you. Um, I guess, you know, there could also be situations where, I don't know, Rwanda or, or maybe Sri Lanka, you, mm -hmm. getting access to a no republic is, potentially uh, incredibly difficult or or maybe impossible I, I i'm not sure what the legal systems are, are like in those countries or or elsewhere yeah, that, uh, that's the point that's the point the, the, and the, also the, the authority of notary, of notary publics comes from the state and if the state is a failed state or mm -hmm. a corrupt state that power is meaningless it's, it's, it has right. no point zimbabwe <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. uh, but also, you know, if you're, I, I guess, you know, I'm thinking, uh, you know, really low on the totem pole socioeconomically, uh, you know, you're, you're potentially the benefit of, uh, or the beneficiary of a gift from Oxfam, for instance, right? Somebody bought you a goat or a couple of goats. Great. Mm -hmm. I'm a poor farmer. I'm going to take these goats. I'm going to do this thing. You know, if, if maybe one day you, you have the money to actually go ahead locally and, and obtain some land or something like that, um, you know, you've saved up all this money and maybe you have enough money now to, to, to obtain the land, but you don't have all the money to go through all the legal hoops. Uh, which, you know, I, heck, I live in Canada and I see people run into that all the time. You're like, oh, I'm ready to buy a house, but, oh, I need another $3,000, $5,000 to like do all these legal stuff instead, you know, potentially taking the notary public out or, or you know, that mechanism, some sort of, you know, face-to-face -face personal mechanism to, to of, of trust. 
reduces fees and therefore also you know reduces the 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 um, barrier to entry, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, of course, there are some problems that technology in itself will not solve. Sure. Yeah, uh, it it would be really um, to it's it's just. It's stupid for us technologists to think that we can solve every problem with technology, but I'm pretty sure that this kind of technology it's 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 setting the infrastructure for people to create tools that will enable other people to 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 be capable of doing things like that and sure. having less reliance on <clears throat> legal systems and on systems that uh, have been that people are trying to make work and that they are so corrupt or they are so uh, failed that there's nothing more than that you can do. And then you can have some, some other option. Sure. Um, not, I'm not looking for you to respond to this. I'm just, I just thought, you know, it, it's not even maybe a matter of cost. It could just be a matter of, of physical access. You know, mm -hmm. I have plenty, we have plenty of places in Canada that are incredibly remote. And you know, to to force somebody to have to travel four hours, eight hours, maybe a whole day just to go, you know, get something stamped by a notary public is it's can be quite costly and and you know uh, unnecessarily uh, hindering uh, progress potentially. Anyway, um, you so you're building a protocol. It's the WitNet protocol. Uh, the website describes it as a as an Ethereum side chain. So you mentioned scalability earlier. Does the WitNet protocol operating as a side chain or or what is effectively a side chain? Does that help solve some of the existing scalability issues with with the Ethereum blockchain? Well, I don't think there is a silver bullet for for the scalability issues that one can see on uh, in Ethereum. In one hand, I do think, I do think that WinNet can help offload some, uh, yeah, some, some of the simplest contracts from mm -hmm. Ethereum because WinNet itself without connection to Ethereum, that it, it has a connection with Ethereum, but WinNet itself has its own blockchain and you can create very dummy smart contracts they I, I prefer to call them uh conditional payments like if this happen then alice get the money if the if it doesn't happen or if it happens in some other way bob gets the money and we i i do think that that there, there's a demand for that kind of conditional payments and some other a little more complex um uh, const constructs like derivatives and things like that that you can actually build with WebNet without something more sophisticated and super feature complete like mm -hmm. uh, the Ethereum smart contracts and the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, so yeah, I th I do think that WebNet will help afloat some work, but that's not something radical. On the other side, the 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 features that WebNet is going to to enable. On with uh, on Ethereum for for Ethereum smart contracts, I I can perfectly see that it will make demand for Ethereum smart contracts increase for sure. Okay, and 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 this is perfectly okay because it it will make um, it it will help visibilize what's the kind of uh, load that that the Ethereum developers. Uh, and the Ethereum community as a whole need to target as a yeah for 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 something for something production ready or for something that we can scale uh, right. in the next years. And this is this is something very very nice from our point of view because if if we do if we do if we do good, if Ethereum will do good. If Ethereum does good. Uh, we will do, uh, and th there's there's a very very win-win uh, situation with this. We we don't try to compete with Ethereum at all because uh, we're not solving the same problem. We are trying right. to enhance Ethereum by being complementary, by working side by side. And I think 
Ethereum solves uh, what they wanted to solve in a very elegant way, in, in a way in which that it's hard to me to imagine uh, some some other way to do that. But right. it, of course, the way Ethereum is designed, you need to pay for the work of uh, of, of a lot of nodes that do need to run a lot, uh, like every every contract at the same time. Right. So probably people are paying for much more security than th that they need. And that's why there are some, uh, yeah, it, it's a little overkill for exchanging cat cards. And <laughs> <laughs> so probably for Ethereum solution will be some kind of sharding solution, right. probably uh, moving from proof of work to a other consensus algorithm will help uh, with some challenges, although maybe that's impossible for, maybe it's impossible moving from proof of work to proof of stake, for example, uh, because you will find some resistance from, from the current miners. Uh, so the cool thing about the Ethereum community is that they value themselves uh, and I feel also part of, of that community. We value mm -hmm. ourselves as a community more than we value probably like, I mean, the the product that, that we are making together because it's it's a solution to a problem that if we can come with a better solution, uh, there's no reason for, uh, for it to be part, uh, for it not to be part of the Ethereum ecosystem and I can perfectly see uh, Ethereum having two different chains, one working with proof of work, which will can be some kind of um, very Bitcoin-like chain and something more fluid or more flexible or more progressist or whatever you want to call it, uh, sure. in which people will have some more advanced features like sharding and, and so on, and in which people can choose that they're like decide which are the trade-offs regarding security and cost or latency mm -hmm. or whatever they need for their particular use cases. It's impossible for one chain with constants with with parameters that you cannot per, that you cannot uh, choose to to fit every every use case. That's obvious. True. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, having to do work. Uh, I know that uh, the WitNet protocol has or is going to have uh, witness nodes. Can you give us a little bit of background info on how those work? And, you know, are, are they full nodes that download the full Ethereum blockchain? Are they only downloading um, WitNet protocol transactions? Um, actually, let, let's start with that and then we'll talk about WIT tokens yeah. after. Well, actually what happens is that uh, Anyone can will be able to send data requests to the WebNet network. So these data requests simply say uh, they're not open questions. They're go to this URL, parse the parse the content as a JSON, for example, a JSON object. Then pick this particular piece of data, like this data, and transform it in this way, then go to this other URL, pick this and aggregate everything together and report it. And right. that, that's a data request. So what, what you send along this data request is you choose a replication factor. So how many nodes will run that uh, data retrieval for you? And also you attach um, a reward in form of with tokens uh, to that transaction and that reward needs to be proportional to the replication factor that you chose. So how many uh, witnesses will be employed and, and next thing that will happen, that will happen is that those, uh, those witness nodes will be randomly selected from the, from all the nodes in the witness network and they will be able to uh, retrieve that data. They will report it. And then uh, inside the WinNet blockchain, uh, the miners for the blocks, which are the same as the nodes, 
uh, running the, 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 attest, the data re retrieval, they will run the um, aggregation code and consensus code uh, for comparing or for aggregating the data that different uh, witnesses, different nodes in the witness network uh, will report. So as a, as a data requester, you can choose which sources are, are used Mm -hmm. how they will be normalized, transformed, and, and aggregated. And you can also choose the consensus fac function. You can filter out outliers. You can uh, drop the errors or you can report it in some uh, any other way. You can perfectly define who will be rewarded and who will be not, depending on what level of certainty is acceptable for you, for your use case, for your businesses for your smart contracts. And then uh, what will happen is that you can also uh, choose how that data will be delivered. So you can uh, have it delivered to a website, like to a, a, an API of your own, or you, you can request for it to be delivered to some Ethereum smart contract. So that's, that's like how WitNet works separately, and uh, then it then comes the connection with Ethereum. For connecting with Ethereum, what we are building is a system for Ethereum smart contracts to be able to post, uh, to send data requests to the WitNet network, and then have the data delivered back to Ethereum. Okay. So this is possible thanks to what we call the bridge nodes, which uh, have full, which are full nodes in, in the WebNet blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain, and they do this work of uh, communicating their requests and their results from one chain to another. And in, in all of this, the WIT token is very important. It's a, it's a native token to the WITNET network. Mm -hmm. And it's, as I said, it's attached to the data requests. And only if you, as a, if you're a node, as a, as a witness, as a node in the WITNET network, performs, their, performs the data requests, it, it gets uh, assigned. If, if, if it performs them um, honestly, it, and it doesn't um, tamper with the data and it reports it uh, matching the consensus, it, you will get a reward. If you, if you try to tamper with the data or if you fail to retrieve that data from, uh, from the sources, uh, right. you, will, you will get nothing. And indeed, you will be punished because it has a, rep a reputation system that keeps uh, that keeps the, the different nodes engaged with the protocol because you lose reputation if you do not fulfill your assignments and keeps everyone uh, honest over time because it creates uh, incentives in the short, medium, and long term to, as I say, keep working and abiding by the protocol and doing uh, work for the protocol. Right. But then the Ethereum smart contract developers don't actually need the WIT token because uh, the, it's the bridge nodes that sit in between the two networks who own WIT and who own ETH and they, they receive uh, rewards from the uh, Ethereum smart contracts for posting uh, the data requests on WITNET using their Wits, and right. then they they uh, they earn with rewards for sending uh, their results to the originating smart contracts in Ethereum using their ETH. So it's it's a scheme that w works pretty well because mm -hmm. uh, we don't force anyone to adopt any uh, token that it doesn't belong to their platform. And right. I think that's the right thing to do. I don't think that ERC20 utility tokens may make 
much more sense that using ETH itself, which is always cheaper to use inside Ethereum. So yeah, that's that's like a very sensible model uh, in our opinion. Okay, I'll disagree with you on your utility token, but only because we have one, and I know why it's for, what it's for. <laughs> but that's fine. Yeah, but, but so it, 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 of course, uh, in 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 many cases, they they actually have uh they have this utility and they make right. sense that uh if you can do it with if and you don't know like to create a limited supply or to uh create some community around it there's no, there's no use for it fair enough fair enough um so i what so is the wit token just is it just a native token within the protocol? Like, what, like, what is it? Like, what, what is it? It's not, maybe it's not an ERC twenty. Is it an ERC? What's the new one? Seven twenty three. Like, what, what is the WIT token? It's a, it's a native token to the WIT blockchain. So it doesn't exist at all. Uh, okay. In, at Ethereum and for Ethereum developers, they don't even need to know that that it exists. Fair enough. Okay, cool. Um, we actually had a, a question come in, uh, but it is here. So, what other what other similar projects or protocols do you see as competing with Witnet? And and if, if if there are any any, how do you see Witnet differentiating itself from those competing platforms? Well, the most popular uh, Oracle solution in the space, which have been around for for quite a while is oracleize that that's a centralized service run by a company so it's something that it's quite okay for pocs for getting data from the outside for educating on why an oracle is useful but mm -hmm. uh, of course it it it's not something that you can use in a really trustless uh contract or, or for production in, in which you really want, uh, want your contract not to be uh, blocked or censored or, or tampered uh, by anyone. So that's, mm -hmm. that's something that obviously will not uh, suit the, the, the kind of uh, use cases that are, more, the, that are the most valuable on Ethereum, which will probably have to do with um, decentralized autonomous organizations and in that kind of software that is completely unmanned, there's no human interaction with it and it mm -hmm. just simply runs and do whatever it, it, it needs to do. And regarding decentralized Oracle networks, there's this other project called Chainlink, which we uh, actually find quite interesting because they're 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 trying to solve the same problem, but they are like there there's no formal uh, definition of the Oracle problem at the end of mm -hmm. the day. So we both claim to be solving the Oracle the Oracle problem, but in in a similar way. Uh, but at the same time in a different way because right. we are thinking about some use cases, they are thinking uh, about different use cases, probably more uh, corporate ones, and we are taking different approaches on uh, also on architecture uh, because they are Ethereum based and for us and our reputation system, uh, we, we don't find uh, that building that on top of Ethereum smart contracts is uh, sustainable or scalable. We think there's intrinsic value in ha having a separate chain. Uh, so that's something that they also acknowledge that they have um, different priorities and they they started building, um, like focusing on different things and doing uh, and building on top of Ethereum, and we decided to go like the other way and start with the chain and then integrating with Ethereum. Actually, we have very good relations with them. We are trying to find ways to, to work together. We are, we are actually uh, cooperating in some aspects regarding mm -hmm. uh, standardization and 
like trying to make life easier for developers who want to get data into their smart contracts. So right. we think that we need to make this effort to create standard interfaces for data coming from oracles uh, to be consumed by smart contracts and and a lot of other stuff that, that will, yeah, we, we are, both projects are quite aligned in our goals. So so it's it's great that, that we can work together. Cool, okay. Uh... Last question. I'm going to add a second part, a two-parter to it, though. Um, one, do you have a timeline for, you know, let's say a full version one that's completely usable by developers? Uh, uh, you know, when you want that to be out. And and the second part is, you know, uh, oh wait, that is the question. When are you hoping to have a full protocol, you know, rolled out that that's actually fully usable by? Eddie on our team or Isaac or, you know, uh, anybody who's working who, who needs that data and, and needs it in production. Yeah. Okay. One thing is the, is the protocol that uh, is pretty much described in our white paper, which, uh, which was published just one year ago. Last week, we celebrated uh, we celebrated the anniversary with cake and everything. Congrats. <laughs> Uh, one thing is, is the protocol, which is uh, pretty much explained in that, but we are now creating a thorough specification for it to be implemented not only by us, by, but by anyone wanting to, to create an alternative implementation of the Witness mm -hmm. protocol. And then we, at the, with, at, as Witness Foundation, we are creating uh, a, like a first implementation to show the world that this works and this is a viable solution for uh, for the Oracle problem. And we, we, we really want to get it right. We, as I told you, we feel some important pressure to get it right in time. So we really hope uh, to have some to have the full implementation working uh, by the end of next year or early 2020, but we, that's something that uh, we cannot commit at this time. We, sure. The only thing uh, I, can, I can perfectly guarantee you is that next January 31st, we will be releasing our first testnet. Oh, okay. So that 2019. So okay, so it's a couple of months. So, yeah, so on the test net, people will be able to download the node software, run it, participate in bridge nodes or, or the the actual data requester nodes, or for, I guess data yeah, for, polar. For, for the test net, we are not uh, targeting yet uh, interoperability with Ethereum because sure, we, sure. We, we feel that we need to, to first fo focus on the uh, most, uh, like the base use story, which is uh, having the, the probably, let's say, the, the weather uh, in Berlin on February 24 uh, retrieved. And if it was sunny, Alice get the money. If it was not sunny, Bob gets the money, which it's a, it's it's quite an interesting uh, value proposal for for something in the, in the testnet stage and for a first release because that's something probably very useful for a, for a lot of people because it's like sure. smarter Bitcoin or something like that. I I, I mean I, I don't Place your bets. with all my respect <laughs> with all my respect to Bitcoin and the Bitcoin developers who are gods for me, but but I mean it's. I, I actually do think that that's something valuable, valuable in itself. And then we will uh, make an iterative process of uh, making new releases, new releases every two weeks and uh, creating, a, like starting a new testnet every two months uh, until we feel that everything is stable enough for, uh, for realizing it and making people run it and from that moment everything changes because we can we will not be able to change anything in the protocol or in the implementation 
uh, unnoticed uh, because people will be running it and sure. every change that we will want that we want to make from that moment will need to go through the witness improvement proposals uh, workflow, which is pretty much similar to BIPs on, on Bitcoin or EIPs and in Ethereum and mm -hmm. everything will be, um, will engage the community, uh, the community and, and, and we really, uh, feel that if, if we, we are not capable of opening WebNet to the community and, rec and relinquishing our power as, I don't know, promoters or writers of the white paper and right. first implementers, uh, we, we would, we, that, that would be a failure for us. So sure. that's, that's why we are, we are trying to do everything we can do to engage people from the community, uh, to give them, uh, as much power, power as we have, actually, we have some external contributors who don't, who we don't even know their names and they have right access in our GitHub repo because this is a community effort and we have the luck to, we have the luck to, to have secured enough funds for being working on that. But the Winnet Foundation does not have, um, a business model. Our role is right. that just creating the first implementation of the protocol and fostering the community around it, and then just uh, relinquishing that relinquish that power and just making sure that that everything works and, and that's all. But in equal um, conditions with everyone else in the community, in the community, which is uh, slowly but steadily uh, growing day by day. Great. Uh, yeah, I actually joined the, the Discord community recently, and so did uh, my fellow community manager, Brady McKenna from District Zero X <laughs> recently. So, uh, so uh, Adan, thank you so much. Muchas gracias for your time today. Uh, everyone, if you want to learn more about WITNET, uh, the website is witnet.io. Uh, the, there's a whole community page there dedicated to how, you know, showing you where to connect and how to connect to to the witnet team and the rest of the community telegram discord medium twitter you know all the rest and uh and, and hopefully uh 2019 is really good for you 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 have a lot of people participate in the test net and uh and the development uh goes really well and late 2019 early 2020 we'll see full release and i'll start running a bridge node hopefully or something like that and uh and and we'll go from there uh, so thank you very much and uh, have a great day, everybody. Thanks a lot, Derek and everyone else in the film team.